Thanks for joining us once again, another one of our Safer at Home series programs. I'm glad to have you here tonight. Um, a couple things before we get started. Um, as you uh, as you know, um, our programs are sponsored by Martha's Vineyard Savings, Cape Cod 5, um, and um, a First Citizens Federal Credit Union. All books that we uh, offer on our programs are um, available at the Eight Cousins Bookseller. Um, uh, so we want to make sure that you uh, spend some time honoring the, uh, the, the local businesses. So um, please uh, shop at Eight Cousins. And um, um, if you're new to, the, uh, to our programs, remember at the end, we'll, we'll ask questions. Use the chat feature down below. Um, please mute yourself so um, um, that uh, we can just listen to our, to our speaker. So um, I'm trying to be polite. And um, our speaker tonight, uh, Joseph Kelly, is a professor and director of Irish and Irish American Studies at uh, College of Charleston. And um, he was also explaining to me that he, as a, as a college professor, he understands the joys and sorrows of, uh, of virtual teaching and hybrid teaching. So he's, uh, um, he, he's been living the Zoom life too. So um, uh, would you welcome our speaker tonight, uh, Joseph Kelly. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, and uh, an added, I, I have indeed been been living on Zoom for almost a year now. Uh, I, I know the the joys and, and the travails of it. And one of the joys is I, I see two of my very close friends from college who I haven't seen in years are, are joining us. Uh, Robin Polito from California and Fred Miller from Alaska, which never could have happened had we not been doing this via Zoom. So there definitely is a silver lining. Rob and Fred, thank you so much for coming here. I very much appreciate it. And I appreciate the invitation from Museums on the Green. And thank you all, uh, every one of you, for taking time out of your Thursday evening to come hear me talk. Uh, I've, I've got a PowerPoint that I'm going to come into and out of. Uh, if I can get a, I've got a little film clip too that I'm going to run if I can get it to work. So please bear with me as I switch back and forth from, from myself to the PowerPoint and to, to the YouTube clip. So let me see if I can share my screen successfully here. And Mark, I'll trust you to let me know if you cannot see what you should be seeing. No, so hear. far, so good. Great. Okay. Very good. So uh, the book I'm talking about, of course, is uh, Maroon, Jamestown, Shipwreck, and a New History of America's Origin. And it, it's, it's a big, fat book. I hope the, the, the narrative is compelling. This is one of those cases where truth is stranger than fiction. So I think just, just telling the story, I, I hope, is compelling to get you through that, that thick book. But I'm just going to touch on each one of these three uh, kind of briefly, maybe giving you a, a taste of it, an idea of some of the ideas that, that I'm exploring in the book. I'm going to do it a little out of order, begin really with shipwreck, and then talk about Jamestown. And if we have time, I'll get to what I mean by a new history of America's origin, a new way of interpreting Jamestown, and by consequence, a new way of interpreting uh, Plymouth Plantation as well. So I'm going to try to start if I can, with a film clip of a shipwreck. So I'll share my screen again and try to get this going.
I guess that worked because I didn't hear any any complaints. Now, of what what uh, maybe more astute of you could have picked up. I know you couldn't really make out the words very much in in that film rendering, but maybe you noticed or figured out that this is the opening scene from Shakespeare's Tempest, which premiered in 1611 in Blackfriars Theater in London. Now, of course, Shakespeare would not have had these kind of dramatic special effects. Um, at, at his hand to, to, to wow the audience, but the audience was wowed nonetheless because he was using, uh, he used his words. And if you read Shakespearean plays, you, you know how he conveys the scene through the words. Uh, he, he's, you know, of course, well, well renowned as the, as, as the greatest wordsmith in the English language, in the history of the English language, probably. But in this case, he actually happened to be stealing these words, or borrowing, I should say. Uh, he put his spin on them, but this is really a scene that is what we would call ripped from the headlines. Now, there were no headlines yet in 1611. It's about 10 years later before newspapers get invented. Um, but news was conveyed. It was conveyed through rumors, conveyed through pamphlets, it was conveyed through uh, private uh, manuscripts that would circulate, and that's what this was. This was a private manuscript that was written by a guy named William Strachey, who was a, a friend of Shakespeare, who was on a ship in the Atlantic Ocean, not in, in, the, in the Tempest, it's in the Mediterranean, but it, the, the real life story was in the Atlantic Ocean, and it, this storm took place in 1609. And it was, uh, the Sea Venture was the name of the ship, and it was the flagship of a fleet of nine vessels that was heading from London to the Chesapeake Bay to resupply the Jamestown uh, colony that was there since 1607. And here's, here's a modern rendering by, by a Bermudian artist uh, of the Sea Venture and its wreck. And it's, a, it's very historically accurate, the details on the ship and that kind of thing and the, and, and the view of uh, Bermuda here. So let me go back a little bit and tell you, tell you what was going on. How did, how did the Sea Venture end up getting wrecked here? Um, as I said, it was, it was the flagship for the third resupply of Jamestown. The Virginia Company knew that the first two years had not gone well because there's been three successive uh, ships that have returned from Jamestown in the first two years reporting on what was going on. It was a disaster. There were desertions, there were mutinies, there was starvation. Every time they would send 100 people, you know, half of them would be dead within a year. The Virginia Company knew this was going on, so they either had to cut bait or they had to really up their game and they decided to up their game. Their plan was to establish essentially an entire English town in Jamestown. They were gonna send 800 people over and they started a, a media blitz, what we would call a media blitz today, um, to recruit settlers. They wanted to get 800, that was gonna include um, uh, farmers, blacksmiths, tailors, woodworkers, uh, you know, every kind of profession that they were, they were advertising and trying to get people to come. In addition to that, and, and this is one of the pamphlets, this is probably the most extensive pamphlet they used to try to persuade people to take the risk of going to Jamestown. Um, of course, they tried to kind of keep quiet how, how horrible things were going over in Jamestown. So most of the people in England, when they thought of colonies, they're thinking of what's going on in Ireland. And this is essentially what the Virginia Company is trying to do. They're trying to replicate the way the English were colonizing Ireland. They were gonna do that in Virginia. And in addition, and this is the really remarkable thing about this particular venture, is that the Virginia Company was a joint stock company, which meant that people bought shares. And the way they wanted to finance 
sending all these people and providing, provisioning the ships, uh, was by selling shares in the adventure to, uh, to, to anybody who would want to buy them. Now, one share costs 12 pounds, 10 shillings. Uh, so a lot of rich people bought shares, knights and the aristocracy, about 2% of the English population is in, in the aristocracy. Um, but, but everybody could buy. If you were a grocer, you, your guild would meet and you would add your two pence to everybody else's two pence until it added up to 12 pounds, 10 shillings, and then, and then the guild would buy a share. So one of the things that's really remarkable about the third supply is now the entire country is in, literally invested in this enterprise. The nine ships go sailing down the Thames River in late June, 1609, and, and crowds are cheering for it on the side. Now, then they go down, they, they put in at Plymouth, pick up some more supplies, and they head off. And of course, England sinks over the Eastern horizon and they've got nothing but ocean in front of them. Now, from their perspective, this is a little strange because most of the English voyages that had, well, all of them, except for one sort of exploratory voyage that were, that were going to the Chesapeake would actually go south and they'd skirt the coast of Portugal and go down to the islands off the coast of Africa and then island hop across the Caribbean and then go back up the East Coast. So you were never, uh, you're never five weeks away from the last time you had seen land but this is what they were experiencing. So one of the things I, I, I try to, to emphasize is sort of the psychological experience of, of these settlers and the sailors as well. They have five weeks of wonderful, wonderful sailing. Good winds, fair weather. They're about a week away. They estimate they're about a week away from the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. And a hurricane comes in. Now, again, imagine what, one of the reasons I wanted to show you that, that clip was to, to help you imagine the psychological experience of an Englishman who has never been more than an hour or two or you know, maybe half a day away from seeing land. Uh, what the experience is going through an Atlantic tempest like a hurricane. Uh, they had no words to imagine hurricane. So they, did, they had to use, hurricane is actually, you know, a native word that, that came from the Spanish. Uh, Shakespeare kind of uh, domesticated it by calling it a tempest and putting it in the Mediterranean. They thought they were, the hurricanes came out of territory that was outside of the purview of God Almighty. They thought they were sent by the devil. So they actually thought we were, they were going to hurricane psychologically was going outside not only of civilization, but outside of the sight of God. And, and, and William Strachey's narrative that talks about this storm, talks about that where they, they were saying prayers, as you saw in the, in the film clip, uh, but they didn't think God could hear their prayers. They couldn't go up high enough because the storm was so loud. So he, he describes the storm in just fantastic, fantastic language. The ships get scattered, they get demasted, uh, you know, they take on water, their provisions get sodden, but eight of the nine ships eventually limp into the Chesapeake Bay, wounded, but nothing more than that. Now that's going to cause problems of its own, uh, which I'm just going to have to put aside for a second because of time constraints. But essentially, you know, what was supposed to be the third resupply of Jamestown, uh, and Jamestown was just barely hanging on, you know, barely sustainable at the time, ends up being a whole bunch of refugees showing up at, at Jamestown. So eventually this is gonna to lead to, to what is known as the starving time. Uh, and the starving time takes place because of this hurricane. The sea venture is the one that doesn't make it back. And th those ships that make it into Jamestown assume it's lost at sea and they send reports back. People have their funerals, whatever kind of grief they got. Everyone thinks everyone on the sea venture died because they just disappeared off the face of the earth. But they didn't die. For three days and three nights, they fought the storm. They were manning the pumps, but the pumps could not keep up with the amount of water that was coming in. The very oakum between the planks was spewing out and they were taking salt beef and pounding it with mallets between the planks to try to stop the leaks. But there were so many, they, they couldn't do it. They had candles, they were down looking for where is the other leak down here in the hold. The water just kept coming up uh, and, and, and eventually, 
they had to give up. They just said, we're out in the mid-Atlantic. All we're doing is staving off death for another hour, exhausted, uh, in despair. They batten down the hatches and, 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 just, and, and think that they're going to go down to the bottom of the ocean. And at the, that very moment is the moment the Admiral up on deck shouts land which is miraculous because there's practically no land in the Atlantic Ocean. But this is where they ended up. They happened to come across the Bermuda Islands. Now the Bermuda Islands were known, like Admiral Summers would have known the Bermuda Islands. A typical settler would, wouldn't have known them. The, the, the typical sailor would have known them only by reputation as the Devil's Islands. What you're looking at here is an uh, illustration of the wrecks of ships over the centuries on the Bermuda Islands because of the reefs that are protecting the islands, which the, the Europeans, of course, didn't have a whole lot of experience with. Um, they knew, they knew that if they tried to get to the Bermuda Islands, they were gonna end up on a reef, but that's all, that's all they could do. So they deliberately ran the ship aground. It, it, it ended up about a mile offshore, if you can see the, the very upper right corner, I can't see it because my own face is blocking it on my screen. Hopefully you can see it on your screen. Uh, it almost looks like the, the corner of a, uh, of a square. Uh, that's where they ended up wrecking, about a mile offshore. Everybody got ashore, 150 souls, not a single one lost, which is just incredible. Um, sailors, about 30 of them were, were sailors, uh, about 120 were settlers. Uh, two of them were Native Americans uh, who were basically ambassadors for Powhatan into St. James's Court. Uh, when they got ashore, they bolted into the woods and the English never saw them again in, in, for, for, for nine months, basically. Uh, they wanted to have nothing more to do with the English and the English ship. Uh, and they knew woodcraft, so they knew how to live off the land. And so, so they just disappeared. Uh, now, what takes place in on these islands. This is sort of the center of my book and, and, and the center of the argument. Um, first off, Admiral Summers gets in one of the long boats and, and starts charting the islands, which have never really been well charted. This is his actual map that he created while they were shipwrecked in Bermuda. And, and you, you can see, you might even be able to make out the word Gates's Bay up in the upper right corner of that, that, that square. Um, and there's a little beach there. It's not really a bay. There's a little curve of, of beach and they ferried everything, all the people, they started uh, getting all the supplies off the ship, uh, cannibalizing the ship as well as they could as it was getting chewed up by the waves and, and the reef. Um, and probably this is, this is that same artist who, who painted the shipwreck. This is, this is his, uh, and from the best we can tell, this is probably a pretty, this is our best guess of, of what their encampment would have looked like between the hills that front the beach. And of course, above the beach, they're not gonna do this on the beach, but they start building these kind of houses. Um, but very quickly, things go sour. Uh, the, and, and I won't go into great details about this, but there are a series of what, uh, the Virginia company is going to call mutinies. And the first one is done by the sailors who come under the thumb of the governor. So the governor who is supposed to, he has a second charter that is going to put Jamestown on its right track. Um, and the second charter gives him a, an awful lot of authority, a lot more authority than the governor had in Jamestown under the first charter. Um, but the sailors are not used to being bossed around by a governor. They, they think their only boss is Admiral Summers and he's off charting the islands. Uh, so they rebel against uh, Sir Thomas Gates, the, the governor, and they go off to their own island. They, this, is, this is almost like a, an episode of Survivor. So now the, the camp is split up into two different factions. One, the 30 sailors living on their own island, setting up their own camp under their own rules and the settlers themselves under Sir Thomas Gates. Now, what happened in those five weeks through, through very fine sailing is that the sailors who had been to Jamestown began telling the settlers what the real conditions were. 
the settlers had all been sold a bill of goods. That 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 media blitz had had said, "You're going to be going to this is a fantastic thing. This is going to you know wonderful place. You know it, it's almost like paradise." But the sailors explained to them that everybody who goes there dies, and so they knew they knew they were pa basically facing a death sentence. And the hurricane was like an act of God that put them on Bermuda. And they look around and they say, "Well, we are in paradise." Why would we go to Jamestown? Where we're probably going to starve to death. Why don't we stay here? There's fish teeming in the lagoons. Uh, there, there are more pigs than you can imagine. They could barbecue forever to their heart's content. They would just hold out their arms and start shouting, and the birds who are not used to human beings would land on their arms and they would just grab them. And there's dinner right there. It's almost like Eden. You know, it's just being provided for them. So the settlers decide. They want to say they want to do what, what the Indians did, and they want to do what the sailors did. And at first, a group tries to do that. They start a, a, a whisper campaign. We're going to go off to our own island, and and we're going to set up our own camp. But Governor Gates gets wind of it, and um, I don't have time to go into all the details of these mutinies, but he, you know, it's it's a pretty brutal rule that puts it down, and and very quickly it becomes clear to the settlers that they are living in what is really a slave labor camp. Um, they are mustered in the morning and counted. They are gathered into labor gangs. And then, then they, get, they go off either into the woods to start felling trees or they're working on the project of building a ship out of the Bermuda cedars and whatever they can salvage from the sea venture so they can sail to Jamestown which is exactly what they don't want to do. They imagine that they are building their own coffins. Um, so there's a lot of resistance. And, and Sir Thomas Gates is putting it down with the gentlemen settlers, those settlers who were able to actually muster themselves enough money to buy a share, and then they're given more shares for going. Most of the settlers got one share in the company for committing their body to this enterprise. They didn't, they didn't commit any money, they just committed their body. Uh, so let me take a little bit of a digression here. I've, I've, I've kind of given you, you know, described what's going on on the ground in Bermuda, in, in, in this paradise that's being turned into, into a dystopia. And I want to talk a little bit about maroons then and the concept of maroons, because it was very important in the English consciousness in the late 16th and early 17th century. Um, the term maroon itself, you probably know, you think of maroon, you think of somebody who is shipwrecked on a deserted island. They are marooned there against their will, and they have to uh, salvage what they can from whatever ship or belongings they can and, and confront the frontier, confront the wilderness, and somehow reconstruct life in, on this deserted island. And that's the life of a maroon. But the origin of that's really a metaphoric use of the term. The original use of the term was on Santa Domingo when the Spanish came and they brought their cattle from Spain to their plantations. Uh, and, and the cattle would escape, some of the cattle would escape and they go out into the woods and essentially go from being domesticated to, to being wild again. And they were called cimarrones. That was a term that was used for them. And then very quickly, that term came to be applied to enslaved Africans in Spanish colonies in the West Indies. Um, wherever the Spanish went, you know, you know, the West Indies very quickly, within a generation, is practically entirely depopulated of uh, the native population. So the Spanish had to, this is, this is what, of course, you know, fueled the African slave trade. So the S Spaniards would bring Africans to their colonies in the New World and enslave them. And wherever they did this, everywhere, uh, you know, in Panama, in, 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 in the Yucatan, in, uh, in South Carolina, in, uh, um, in, in, in any of the island, in any of the islands, in Cuba and Jamaica, uh, wherever there were Spanish and there were slaves, those slaves would steal themselves away. Some of them, these enslaved peoples, would escape and they would go into the least hospitable places, the places where the Spanish would not follow them. So they went to live in the swamps, they went to live in the mountains, the, the, the jungles, 
and, and they would set up their own communities. And some of these communities were really, really remarkable. What you're looking at right here is a reconstruction of a maroon community in four hole swamp outside of Charleston, where, which is where I am right now. And uh, we're, uh, I've, I've done a lot of my research on, on uh, slavery and, and antebellum South with, with Charleston as a focus. And there were even, you know, within, with, within a, a couple miles of working plantations uh, in South Carolina, there were maroon communities, free slaves, or, or enslaved people who had freed themselves and were, would go and live in the swamps. And they would actually even trade with, with people in these places. It's really remarkable culture. Uh, some of the biggest in the United States, of course, were the Great Dismal Swamp, had lots of maroons in them. Uh, sometimes some communities generations old that were not liberated until the Civil War. Uh, Spanish Florida, of course, had, had very large maroon communities, essentially established forts and cities. Um, so the English were very much aware of these maroon, um, you know, this maroon culture. Uh, now, in the time that we're looking at here with Jamestown, of course, this is before any, any of these Maroon communities I've just mentioned. Uh, the first English encounter with a Maroon community was actually, uh, well, let me, I'm gonna skip over this right here and get, get to Sir Francis Drake. The, the, the first time um, the English encountered Maroons was when Sir Francis Drake in the 17, uh, in the 1570s was uh, raiding, doing pirate raids on Spanish Panama. And he was, he was not very successful, but there was a maroon community in Panama that heard about what he was doing and they sent envoys to find him and they parleyed with him and they convinced him. He, he went on a, on a many week journey into the hinterland and went and visited their villages and their towns. In fact, at one point they bring him up on a mountain in Darien and they climb this gigantic tree and up there they have a, a platform, almost like a, a tree house. And it's at that moment that Sir Francis Drake looks out upon the South Sea, what we call the Pacific Ocean. And he vows at that moment, I will go there. And of course, eventually that's gonna to lead to his circumnavigation of the globe and the Golden Hind and becomes one of the richest people in England and, and, and super famous and all that. But right now he's still just a pirate. And, and the Maroons in, in Panama help him raid the Spanish. And he writes it up in the, in, in the and, and the narrative is, is, is what you're looking at right there. So the English actually really liked the Maroons. And in the, seven, in the 1580s, Sir Francis Drake convinces Queen Elizabeth that he can topple the entire Spanish empire with a relatively small force. It ends up being a flotilla of about 25 ships, but he's taking on all of Spanish America. The way he's gonna do it is he's gonna, he's gonna go and raid cities, Cartagena, um, uh, you know, in, 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 in Santo Domingo, he's going to go where in, in St. Helena in, in uh, South Carolina. Um, he, and, and wherever he goes, he's going to incite slave rebellions and he's going to uh, um, ally with the Maroon communities. And this way, a relatively small English force can topple the entire Spanish empire. Um, as a matter of fact, Roanoke, the Roanoke colony, really this is what it was part of this enterprise it was going to be a staging ground um and sir francis drake goes he goes on these raids and there's all sorts of interesting things that happen as a matter of fact uh you know he's acting kind of like a pirate uh which which is a uh you know what historians would call a, a, another masterless community like the maroons themselves so it's a fa fascinating story to watch how 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 pirates govern themselves in, in the caribbean as well um but it didn't, doesn't go according to plan. They don't get as much loot. They don't really, they're not able to incite these slave rebellions. And the last thing he does is go up to Roanoke. And that's when Roanoke gets abandoned and they all get on the ships and go back to England. And, and they had to leave some of them there marooned in Roanoke and they disappear. So the Roanoke story is actually part of, you know, maroons are crucial to, to the uh, uh, Roanoke story. So the English know all about this whole concept of maroons. And essentially that's what's taking place in the English colonies. Englishmen and eventually English women are marooning themselves the way African enslaved Africans were marooning themselves in Spanish America.
So this is this is kind of you know a you know cleaned up version of a, a, a contemporary rendering of uh, uh, the fort at Jamestown, and of course you see the the you might be familiar with the triangular palisade that they have there. And of course we think of this and, and part of the function of, of that or the most obvious function is to protect against Native Americans who are alternately friendly and unfriendly to the Jamestown community. But another function of those walls is that it acts like a prison because the English settlers in the first two years of Jamestown recognized how horrific it is and how incompetent their leaders are. And that if they stay with the Virginia company, they're more than likely going to die. So they begin to steal themselves. They climb over, they tunnel under, they break holes in this, they take whatever goods they can with them to trade with the Native Americans. Uh, you know, we hear about the, 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 the horrible numbers, you know, 100 people arrived when the second supply comes, there's only 30 living. Now, a lot of them did starve. A lot of them died of disease, but a lot of them, a lot of them ran away to live with the Native Americans, the Algonquin Indians on the Chesapeake. This is essentially what is also happening in Bermuda. Now, we don't really, this is not the way we tell the story. We don't tell the story of Jamestown focusing on these. We, we usually think of them the, the way the settlers are, are characterized as, as ne'er-do-wells, as lazy, as, as people who cannot take orders, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of ways of describing them. We don't think of it from their perspective where they recognize if we stay with the Virginia company, we're going to die, so therefore we're going to take our lives into our own hands. The reason we don't is because all the narratives are told by officers of the Virginia company, and it's no different in Bermuda. This guy, this is, this is a kind of, you know, a wax thing in, 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 in a replica of the ship that they built in, in Bermuda. This is William Strachey right here. And he becomes a secretary for the Bermuda company. And he writes a story. He's actually, you know, he, he wants to, he wants to write plays. He wants to write sonnets. So he's, he's something, you know, he, he has some literary talent. His best work is this narrative. Um, all the other stuff is really very, you know, not very good at all uh, to tell you the truth. Um, but what he does, he's telling the story again from the point of view of the Virginia Company, but he tells it so well that we can glean from his story a subtext that's going on. And one of the things that happens if we do is we get introduced to this guy, Stephen Hopkins who I describe as the most important founding father that you've never heard of. Now, many of the people in this audience may have heard of him for reasons that will become obvious if, we get to, if, I, if I get to the end of this lecture, which I, I fear I'm not going to, or maybe it'll come up in, in, in some of the questions. Uh, but he's basically, he's, he's what we would describe as a middle-class middle guy. He uh, is, a, is a failed farmer, marries uh, a daughter of an innkeeper. He ends up on the sea venture. He is part of this shipwreck. He's one of those 150 souls that goes ashore. Um, but he's kind of, a, 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 in many ways, he's kind of a genius. And, and William Strachey describes him as having an adamantine tongue. Uh, you know, he could persuade people. And the second rebellion, well, actually really the third rebellion, if we, if we count the sailors, um, takes place when the ship is getting, is really taking shape that they're building, that this coffin ship that they're, they're imagining that they're building. Um, in January of 1610, Stephen Hopkins starts another whisper campaign, a whole conspiracy where they're gonna get everybody involved and they're, and they're going to raid the armory and they're going to grab tools and they're going to grab weapons and they're in moss. They're going to go off to their own island and they're going to, they're going to be able to protect themselves from the governor and his corps de guard. Um, excuse me, I don't know if you can hear the fire trucks going by. I hope it's not my own building <laughs> that they're stopping at. No, there they go. Um, so Stephen Hopkins' words are actually preserved by William Strachey. Now, William Strachey is telling us what his words are because William Strachey wants to make him a villain. But the things that Stephen Hopkins says sounds eerily like concepts that are articulated by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. He tells everybody, 
the shipwreck has dissolved our contract with the Virginia company. It's true, we signed on and we're supposed to labor for them for seven years, but they were supposed to deliver us to Virginia and they didn't do it. So the contract is dissolved and no man is beholden to any other. They all are essentially political free agents. So he starts, he is theorizing social contract theory before this is, this is uh, uh, you know, half a generation before Thomas Hobbes and well before uh, John Locke are gonna be doing, are gonna actually philosophize it. They're living it in Bermuda. Uh, to make a long story short, the conspiracy goes to two people too many because they become informants. It gets very widespread. It gets so widespread that when Sir Thomas Gates discovers it, he's afraid to confront it head on because he knows by far a majority of the people want to mutiny. And, and by mutiny, just steal themselves away. They don't wanna kill him or anything like that. So he arrests Stephen Hopkins. He tries him, he sentences him to death. He humiliates him in front of the entire encampment. Uh, and Stephen Hopkins is made to beg for his life. Uh, and beg he does, as, as any one of us, I think, would have. There's no, there's no give me liberty or give me death right here. He's really doing what, what I think a real regular, normal human being would, have, would do and say, please don't kill me. And then he keeps his head down and he goes to Virginia and he does his time in Virginia. And, uh, and he does his time like he's doing a prison sentence. And eventually he gets back to England. And, and then there's, there's more to his story. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit about this, this trip to Virginia now. So this is, this is a replica of the ship they constructed. They actually ended up constructing two because the sailors built their own ship on their own island. I mean, it's amazing. You look at this and you think, okay, this is, this is a, a shipwreck community on Bermuda, just salvaging what they can. And this is, this is what they built. It's called the Deliverance. <laughs> very ironic name for this ship for all of the, uh, the settlers who got on it. They, got, they were basically loaded onto it at gunpoint and they sail to the Chesapeake and they sail in and what they find is the end of the starving time. A, a, a colony that is completely wasted. They are supposed to be saved. Now they, they have come out of the wilderness into at least this foothold of English civilization and, and, and they're supposed to be saved. And, and what happens is they, they become the saviors of the survivors of the starving time. So here, here's a rendering of when the starving time here. Now, um, there's more mutinies. All, all together in the first couple of years of Jamestown, there are 14 cases of mass desertions. Uh, we don't usually get them described to us that way. It's usually rendered as the unruliness, the, the people who would not be ruled. And, and, and they are a foil for what's gonna be taking place at Plymouth Plantation. And, and that is why, to a large extent, the, the mythology of the pilgrims has very much eclipsed the mythology of Jamestown. Jamestown is like the, uh, the redheaded stepchild of American history. Everyone knows it was first as the first permanent colony, but no, we don't really think of Jamestown as our origin story, do we? We think of the Mayflower. We think of the, the pilgrims. Now, one of the things that we forget, and, and this, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a teaser here because we don't have much more time than that. Um, but there's really two populations of people on the Mayflower. Most of the people in this audience, I'm sure, know that. There's the saints and there's the strangers. The, the saints are the people that we call the pilgrims. They called themselves the saints. And the other people, the people who were not part of their, their uh, community, their separatist community, were the strangers. Um, and it's those two groups of people who end up settling in Plymouth Plantation. Now, we know this story from, mostly from the lips of William Bradford, from the pen of William Bradford and his of Plymouth Plantation. And he was one of the saints, he was one of the pilgrims. 
but we can read between those lines too. And then that's why I'll just sort of leave you with a teaser about that. But I do want to, I, I know I've only got a few minutes left to, to round things out and, and let you guys uh, ask some questions um, if, if, if I've piqued your curiosity at all. But I want to, you know, everything I've given you so far is really very much sort of my, uh, my historian hat. You know, this is, this, much of the book is narrative history telling, retelling the story of Jamestown, retelling the story of the shipwreck. Um, but I'm, you know, I really reside in an English department and I'm the director of Irish and Irish American studies. It, I would say, you know, my, my, my first permanent academic job is really as a cultural or a literary critic as opposed to as a historian. So I'm going to put that hat on a little bit and I'm going to talk about national mythology. And, uh, and, and this, is, this is where I'll let's sort of conclude with this a little bit. This is where I'm going to talk about the new history of America's origin. And I haven't pre-tested this, so I'm not sure it's gonna work. But hopefully you will hear President Reagan's farewell speech. And that's about all I have to say tonight, except for one thing. The past few days when I've been at that window upstairs, I've thought a bit of the shining city upon a hill. The phrase comes from John Winthrop, who wrote it to describe the America he imagined. What he imagined was important because he was an early pilgrim, an early freedom man. He journeyed here on what today we call a little wooden boat. And like the other pilgrims, he was looking for a home that would be free. I've spoken of a shining city all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds, living in harmony and peace. A city with pre-ports that hummed with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors, and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get there. That's how I saw it and see it still. And how stands the city on this winter night? more prosperous, more secure, and happier than it was eight years ago. But more than that, after 200 years, two centuries, she still stands strong and true on the Granite Ridge, and her glow is held steady, no matter what storm. And she's still a beacon, still a magnet for all who must have freedom, for all the pilgrims from all the lost places who are hurtling through the darkness toward me. We've done our part. As I walk off into the city streets, a final word to the men and women of the Reagan Revolution, the men and women across America who for eight years did the work that brought America back. My friends, we did. We weren't just marking time. We made a difference. We made the city stronger. We made the city free. And we left it in good hands. All in all, not bad, not bad at all. Now, um, you know, I'm your typical kind of moderate, liberal, Democrat academic, and uh, I'm moved to tears every time I see that. Uh, it, it maybe it's taken me 30 years to really appreciate Ronald Reagan, um, but that, that I mean, it's, it's just a very moving image. You, you, can, you can see the appeal of this mythology, the city on the hill. And of course, Reagan didn't reintroduce that image into American politics. It was really introduced into, into American politics by John Kennedy. And Reagan borrowed it and Reagan ran with it. And every president since has, has used that image of a city on a hill. Uh, so this is, this is the mythology, the, the, the origin story that we tell ourselves even today. Um, now, uh, the problem that, that I'm going to suggest that we have with this mythology is not that the mythology doesn't line up with the history. Everybody, I mean, we can debunk the pilgrims and everybody knows, you know, what really went on and things like that. But I, I'm not concerned with that because, I mean, that's what national mythology, you know, kind of glosses over the details of history. And that's, that, that's the way it works. And it has to work if you're going to unite a gigantic and diverse modern nation state with an origin story. Uh, the, the problem that I want to identify with this story is that it is the Exodus story. Uh, 
And it's very conscious the pilgrims thought of themselves as telling an Exodus story. And the heart of Exodus is keeping the faith, keeping pure. And the, 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 the image of city on a hill comes from uh, Winthrop's uh, sermon on the Arbella as, as uh, you know, it wasn't the pilgrims in 1620s, you know, it was in 1630. Um, and, and what that sermon did was basically created a contract, not a social contract among the people on the ship, but a contract with God between the people on the ship on God, with God. And they promised, this is what Winthrop promises in the sermon, is that if God will prevent them from crashing on the rocks, from shipwrecking, then they will stay pure. So the image of colonization in the Plymouth Plantation story is an image of retaining purity, of keeping, uh, keeping our culture safe from what we encounter on the frontier. And the inevitable coda to the Exodus story is the Jeremiah. And this is, this is a very influential book, came out several years ago by Sack Van Berkovich, a you know, really leading American studies scholar, um, who argued that the, the Jeremiad is the sort of defining uh, genre of American literature. And that what the Jeremiah, what, what Jeremiah did, of course, is railed against how the current generation has slipped, has lost the true faith. And this is the second half of, of Plymouth Plantation is really a Jer Jeremiah. The first half is the planting of Plymouth Plantation. The second half is how the younger generation lose the faith and they need to go back to the old faith. So what this mythology leads to and, and fosters is a very, very potent nostalgia and a nostalgia for a pure society generations past and an attempt to reestablish that. My argument would be, and I, and I don't want to turn things really depressing right now, but, but, but it certainly was very depressing for me living in Charleston to see the Confederate flag bandied about in the Capitol building recently. And, um, what I would suggest we're seeing here is a Jeremiah. This movement is, is a Jeremiah. This is an attempt, a, a, a toxic nostalgia that is attempting to get back to the purity of an Exodus story, as opposed to a uh, national mythology that we could borrow from Jamestown, where you have, where the notion of maroonage, of shipwreck, and people cast away onto an island or escaping slavery and trying to recreate civil society on their own in the wilderness. This is essentially what, what I'm trying to do in this book is resurrect what was known as the frontier thesis in American history, the notion that, that American democracy and American civil society really derives from a group of people who are cast into the wilderness and have to fend for themselves and create a civil society because their leaders have, have failed them. And, and if they don't steal themselves away from the Virginia company, they're going to end up dead. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry to, to, to kind of conclude on that, that, that kind of a downer, uh, but I did want to uh, kind of open things up and, and, and suggest maybe the, the larger significance of this argument that, that Jamestown is much more important and should be much more important in the national consciousness than it is. But if it's a Jamestown that we're going to turn to, it's got to be a, a different story. It's got to be the story of those ne'er-do-wells, the mutineers, the deserters, the people who stole themselves away from the Virginia Company and went into the wilderness to establish a new social contract among themselves. So I'll conclude there. Um, I hope I've, I've piqued your curiosity a little bit and, and would very happily uh, entertain questions and, and get some discussion going. Thank you, Professor Kelly. That was awesome. Um, I should, 
um, trying to stop like, 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 like everybody else. I, you know, I'm, those those pictures are, you know, a memory I don't want to share. But uh, a, a question for you, right? Just going back to the beginning, um, ex explain Sir Thomas Gates, the governor. Uh, now, is he actually on? Bermuda is he one of is he one of the the shipwrecked guys and it, was he intended to go to um uh to Jamestown what's his role and what and why is he there yeah yeah so on on uh the sea venture uh the the flagship is most of the supplies for Jamestown the admiral admiral summers uh gates the new governor and remarkably enough the only copies of the second charter um, so, uh, and, and the second charter, as I said, the Virginia company, uh, recognized that their plan for Jamestown for the first two years had failed. So that second charter, I mean, the big difference between the first charter and the second charter is the second charter gives dictatorial powers to the governor. He no longer is really reliant on a council at all. And, um, he really has more powers than King James has in England. Uh, which is re pretty remarkable. So when he gets shipwrecked, when you know he's shipwrecked with everybody else, and the very first thing that he does is he establishes a corps de guard. He takes the gentlemen among the settlers and arms them, and they they begin to guard the provisions. And eventually, they're going to be guarding the settlers themselves to prevent them from running away. Um, so he know, I mean, his his whole destiny is wrapped up with getting to Virginia and being governor there. That's how he's going to make his name. That's how he's going to make his fortune. And he actually knows, he knows he has just a little window. He's got about a year to do this because he knows the fourth resupply is going to bring yet another governor who's going to replace him. And uh, this is Lord Delaware, uh, Delaware, and who's, you know, a, a much more uh, exalted aristocrat. And, and Gates is gonna fade. As soon as Delaware ar arrives on the scene, Gates is gonna be nothing but a lieutenant. So he, he is really thinking the clock is ticking, which is why he wants to, as quickly as possible, build these ships and get to Jamestown. The common story we've all read in our textbooks, going back to you know grade school, junior high, high school, is that um, you know, Jamestown, scuffled for lack of a better word because they was it was always men you know they were coming over looking for gold um you know they, they really didn't it, it, as opposed to plymouth which brought families i.e women who could then give birth and have families yeah. um jamestown just maintained because the death rates was high they didn't have women and what you're seem to be saying is there's a whole lot more to that story than than what we read in the in the book and and, and the maroon was yeah. far more impactful is that safe to say oh absolutely and and uh you know this is the the story that you're telling there of course is is the popular understanding of what happened in jamestown uh you know we have images of people who are too lazy to plant any corn you know or too lazy to go fishing they're starving but, but they they won't go fishing that's not really what happened. That's that's the description of what happened in the words of John Smith. But John Smith has a very, uh, you know, he, he has a, a real vested interest in putting his particular spin on things. So whenever you see the word lazy in the, um, uh, in, in the narratives, you really should translate it to insubordinate because these people were not lazy. They were not lazy at all, but what they were doing, they were refusing to take orders. So when John Smith told them to plant corn, they did not plant corn. But what they wanted to do, I mean, if, if anyone, you know, if you steal yourself off into the wilderness and are living in the frontier, even living in, in an Indian village, which looked like relative paradise to the English, of course, uh, you're going to be working hard. I mean, it's not like, and, and, and in Bermuda, they're not proposing to go off to another island so they can lie around and, and be idle for 18 hours a day. If they're gonna establish their own colony, it's gonna take a lot of difficult, hard labor. They know that. They, these are not lazy people, but they are insubordinate people. Um, and, and so the, the coloration of 
the settlers in, in Jamestown comes to us with this bias to it. Uh, and in addition to that, something I haven't even gotten into, it, are the factions between the officers of the Virginia Company. Um, the fact that the second charter did not get to Jamestown has dire consequences because when those ships limp in to Chesapeake Bay, Jamestown is being run by John Smith. And he's basically running it as, as, as his pirate kingdom. Or really, I mean, most accurate way to describe it, he's running it as uh, an Indian kingdom, a Native American kingdom. He is beginning to rival Powhatan on the Chesapeake and he has allied certain Indian villages. He becomes what we would call paramount chief. So he doesn't, he would, he, when, when those ships come in, they first thought they were Spanish and then they get, they get bummed because they're not this, he would have rather seen the Spanish than seen, seen English come in. And when the, so when they come in, those ships come in, they tell John Smith, hey, you're no longer, you're no longer governor, we're taking over. And he says, oh yeah, show me the papers. And they don't have the papers with them. So, so what takes place then is essentially kind of a civil war between these factions in Jamestown and, and John Smith is the same. He survives an assassination attempt, but it really puts him out of, out of commission and he is, is brought back to England. And without his leadership, that's what leads to the starving time. Uh, I mean, he, he is an effective frontiersman, you know. Um, I, I always got the impression from looking at your book that um, uh, John Smith always came across to me as like the Marlon Brando character in Apocalypse Now. Oh like he's God. got this, <laughs> yeah. this little... Yeah, and, and of course, I mean, the stories of John Smith are told to us from John Smith, but there's, you know, his biographers have, have confirmed an awful lot of what he tells. I mean, you, you want a remarkable t story. Read, read the biography of John Smith. I mean, what a, I mean it is. Uh, an incredible guy and then it ends i mean basically his, his 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 adventure career ends as marlon brando on the chesapeake i mean that's that, that's a good way to kind of put it there he creates his own you know he he does exactly what his enemies in the virginia company expected him to do which is to set him himself up as kind of an indian king on, on, the, uh, on the chesapeake um so uh but he's, you know, his backstory is incredible too. But one of the things, I mean, a lot of people characterize John Smith as the first American because we have these, this wonderful line that he says, he who does not work shall not eat. And we usually interpret that phrase as this anti-aristocratic thing. You know, he, he's telling the, uh, you know, the, the lazy people who came over from England who never did a lick of work in their life and just told their servants to do it that they've got to go work. And if they don't, they're not going to eat. That's not really what the meaning of those words are. The real meaning, he has set up his own faction and he's got his gang of people. And the other people are not taking orders from him. And he's telling them, I'm in charge, I've got the guns. And if you don't listen to what I'm saying, you're not going to eat. Okay. So it doesn't split, uh, Jamestown does not split along aristocrats versus settlers. And, and John Smith, himself is hugely invested in the prestige and authority that comes with being an aristocrat because he earned it himself. He has his shield with his emblems on it, the heads of three Turks that, that he earned by killing those, those Turks in the Turkish wars. Uh, and, and he was knighted, or not knighted, he was, you know, he, he was uh, uh, brought into the, in, into the gentry as a result of that. Uh, and he, he cherishes that authority. He's not repudiating the aristocracy. He just thinks there ought to be a little bit of a merit. Some people ought to be able to get their way in by merit. And once they're in, he wants that. He wants that privilege. Does anybody stay on Bermuda or do they all, are, are they all forced to get, a, get on the boat? <laughs> yeah. So Stephen Hopkins mutiny did not succeed. Uh, and then desperately, shortly before um, they're going to get on the boats, the, the, the final mutiny takes place. And one guy ends up cursing uh, Sir Thomas Gates. He basically says, you can kiss my ass, my arse, you know, of course. And, uh, and they, they kill him. They kill him for saying that. And that triggers uh, 
a whole faction of people to actually, do, they do flee and they successfully flee into the wilderness. And then there's a long protracted negotiation to get them to come back into camp. And while they're out there, they create their own covenant. They actually draw up their own social contract. It's lost to history. We, don't, we only know of it. We don't have the document. Um, but most of the people are persuaded. Gates says, okay, I'm going I'm to pardon you. Come on back. You can come with us, you know, and I'm not going to hunt you down and kill you uh, if you just come back. Uh, three of them don't because three of them were part of that first mutiny. And they, this is sort of double jeopardy. They, they know they've done it again. They don't, they don't trust Gates to not execute them. So they stay and, and Gates is fine. Okay, I'm going to maroon you here. And they go back to, you know, they go to Jamestown and find what they are there. And immediately when they get to Jamestown, they realize they, they don't have any food. They go back to Bermuda. They send a ship back to Bermuda to go kill a bunch of pigs and smoke them and put them in barrels and bring them back to, to feed, feed them in Jamestown. And those three guys are still, still in Bermuda. And Bermuda becomes very quickly a much more viable and productive colony for England than than Jamestown was. It takes longer for Jamestown to actually produce any kind of return on the Virginia Company's investment. You mentioned Hopkins. Um, I had a couple of emails before um, your talk of from Hopkins descendants, you know, that obviously where we're located, there's Hopkins descendants. Yeah. Um, continue your story. He goes, to, he goes to Jamestown, he keeps his head down, but as you mentioned, he's also a Mayflower uh, passenger. So Tell us a little bit more about Hopkins. Yeah, I, did, I actually didn't. I, did, I didn't even give that spoiler alert. But that's what he ends. I, he goes back to England, and eventually, a guy named Stephen Hopkins is on the Mayflower. And for years, historians were, were very tentative and cautious about assuming it's the same man. And and now it's pretty much settled. Uh, you know, it's a consensus that it was the same Stephen Hopkins. And this, for me, is is the really really remarkable part of the story. Um, because we have his words as William Strachey gave them to us in Bermuda. And then we have William Bradford's words describing what took place on the Mayflower. And the remarkable document, of course, that comes out of the Mayflower is the May what we call the Mayflower Compact. And we think of it as, and I think rightly, we, we think of this as the forerunner of the Constitution. And you know, this is a social contract. And people sign their names to it. They are entering into a social contract. And the reason they're doing that is because the Mayflower, of course, is going to put people ashore outside uh, the, where they're, the warrant that they have for settling. They're going to be outside where the Virginia Company has authority for them to settle. And William Bradford says, among the strangers, the strangers started arguing that the moment we get put ashore, we are going to be under the authority of no one. The Virginia, we're, we're not going to be beholden to the Virginia Company because we are going to be settling in territory that is outside their jurisdiction. It is almost identical to what Stephen Hopkins was arguing about the contract with the Virginia Company back in Bermuda. I, I, it, it's remarkable to me that the people before now have not really recognized and made more of this. I mean, I. The, the circumstance, it, it is all circumstantial evidence, but the circumstantial evidence seems really strong that Stephen Hopkins not only signed the Mayflower Compact, but he was probably the leader among the strangers who forced it to be written. It was not really, Bradford says we wrote it to protect ourselves against the strangers. I really think the Mayflower Compact was written at the insistence of the strangers to protect them from the saints. Um, so that remarkable document, I don't think Stephen Hopkins has ever gotten any credit, let alone the credit that I think he is due for that in, in, incredible document that is the Mayflower Compact. And then of course, uh, and people in your audience probably even, and any genealogist, and, and I've, I've encountered, as I've given these talks, of course, I've encountered so many of the Hopkins family uh, who, who know more about Stephen Hopkins than I do. I, I, my deep research really ended in 1612. So what I know about his later life is, is really just from the historians themselves uh, and his bio biographer. Um, but, uh, you know, his, his story in Plymouth Plantation and then in, in Massachusetts uh, is, 
is a remarkable story too, but what makes it so compelling to me is that he ends his days as an innkeeper. Uh, this guy is so middle class. You know, he is not, he, he's not like the other founding fathers. He is a guy that just comes out of the people and he stays his whole life in his people and his contribution has never been acknowledged. And he dies obscure. He dies happy. He's got a big family. And, and obviously he's the progenitor. Of, I, I've seen estimates. It's like in a million people or his descendants or something. It's something absolutely remarkable. Um, we ought to know more. The whole nation ought to know a lot more about Stephen Hopkins. It, um, we had a question here. Um, um, it's interesting, but at the end, are you saying that the invaders in the Capitol last week are similar to the shipwreck to continue separatist groups? Are, are, uh, basically, are, is this a yin and are, are they are they part of the same lineage? I guess. No, no, no. Yeah, and and, and thanks for that question because uh, and 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 I and I recognize I'm I'm going out on a limb here, and I'm I'm. Uh, what I'm really doing, I mean, I, I'm, I'm throwing out, you know, a pretty provocative claim and, and, and I don't know how, how far I would, um, to, to what extent I will defend this claim. But what I'm suggesting there is, uh, there, there are two different kinds of myths then that we can use to think about who we are as Americans. And if we think of our origins as an exodus myth, the, the, the essence of an Exodus myth is purity. And purity essentially dissipates over generations. So that when we get two or three generations away from the, the, the Exodus, the people who, who conducted the Exodus, what we have are, are uh, a society that is recognized as corrupt because it has allowed influences. It, it has become pluralized. Uh, and therefore it is impure, it, it, it has lost the faith of their fathers. And this is the kind of language that, that William Bradford himself uses in the second half of, of, of Flint Plantation. And, and this is why Sackvin Berkovich is, is arguing that the Jeremiah becomes, this is the quintessential, the defining characteristic literary genre of America is the nostalgic looking back to a purer generation and an attempt to reclaim that. So what's very provocative about that image that, that I showed you at the, at the end is that at least some of the people who are doing this are carrying Confederate battle flags with them. And, you know, I, I've been part of the debates about Confederate statues and Confederate memorabilia and the whole lost cause mythology that we have down here in the South, which of course Charleston is, I mean, it begins here. The Charleston is more responsible for the Civil War than any other place. And a relatively small group of intellectuals in Charleston sent the nation on that horrific, uh, tragic course that le leads, to, leads to the Confederacy and leads to the Civil War after the Civil War, the nostalgia for it, the lost cause notion is a longing, a nostalgic longing for a pure society. And of course, this is why it is assumed as the symbol of contemporary white supremacists. It is a racial purity. Um, now the purity is not always a racial purity, it might be more broadly ethnic or cultural purity, but that's what I'm arguing with that final image is, what we're witnessed, that kind of the Exodus mythology is always inevitably going to lead to a Jeremiah where we get troubled by, by plurality, where we get troubled by, by difference and, and we consider it corruption as opposed to enrichment. Where as maroon communities are people hurled into the wilderness, into the frontier and they look to each other and they say, we've got to salvage something out of this and we've got to reconstruct civil society out of the salvage of the old world and with what we can do confronting the new world. And I, I find that a much more productive mythology for the United States to think of when we're trying to define our identity as a people. So I know it was, I mean, it's kind of like throwing a hand grenade and, and, and I, I should probably apologize for even 
throwing up such a volatile, volatile image. Um, but but in, in a nutshell, I mean, that's, that's really why I think this argument, in my mind, is much more important than knowing what really happened in Jamestown. I think it has consequences for who we think we are today and our sense of identity as Americans. Well, I also want to thank you for um, when talking about the, at the beginning, when you talk about the tempest, I'd never really thought about, and I'm sure other people too, if you're a, if you're an English traveler, if you're a colonist, that you've never been more than half a day away from land. I, I, I never, I never put that that equation together. So I, that that it's like, wow, that good point. You know, and it, you're not a sailor by trade necessarily. So it's a, yeah. Although I mean, a, a lot of people would have been sailing and would have gone, you know, through trade, gone to the continent. But I mean, that's a very different kind of journeys than than journeying across the Atlantic. Um, what, what, one of the things that's really interesting about Shakespeare, in, in, in my mind, he's, you know, I love Shakespeare, of course. Uh, I, I am an English professor after all, but uh, he, I don't think, he's the first spin doctor on the Jamestown uh, experience. And uh, there's a guy, one of the villains, of course, Caliban is, is the representative of Native America. And Trinculo and a guy named Stefano are the, the castaways who are the villains. They are, uh, one's a drunk and the other's you know, the, a butler and a jester. And they try to usurp the island from Prospero. And they're, they're, what they're doing is, is trying to assume something beyond their station. And Shakespeare humiliates them. He, they're the butts of jokes. Uh, and by the end of the play, they admit it themselves. Uh, there, there are some scholars, and I'm, I'm within this camp, I mean, this is a controversial claim, but uh, uh, there are some Shakespeare scholars who, who think that Stefano is Stephen Hopkins. Uh, and I think it very much so, I, I, because Shakespeare, we know that he was reading William Strachey's um, Rack and Redemption of Sir Thomas Gates, in which Stephen Hopkins is the villain. And he's the villain because he is trying to usurp what the Virginia Company recognize, thinks of as, as something beyond his station. He is trying to void his contract with the Virginia Company and set himself up as an authority over himself and, and, and establish a new civil society. So um, I, I, I'm very much persuaded by the notion that what Shakespeare is doing in The Tempest is retelling the story of what's, what happened in Jamestown. And he ends up reinforcing the status quo, reinforcing uh, authority, especially aristocratic authority, and undermining the notion that simple, humble people have any authority over their own lives. Before I let you go, I want you to tell everyone the little story you were telling me that, that uh, as part of your job, you're a you, you, you try to take students to Ireland, and you're you're hope you're hoping against hope that the uh, the uh, uh, that COVID will allow that to happen. So just to, uh, uh, just tell people that that what you were telling me. Yeah. Um, well, that's I mean this is this is this is the the non silver lining part of all this as as, as an educator. Uh, of course, last year I, I spend every June in in Ireland with. 20 to 30 uh, college students here from the College of Charleston and uh, had to cancel last year, of course. And, and I've been planning and replanning and uh, over and over again and, 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 and trying to make sense of what is going to be the vaccine regime. What is the schedule of the vaccinations? And I'm getting very pessimistic now. I mean, it's, it's just been, uh, when I canceled last year, I thought, okay, for sure we're gonna go next year. And then when the vaccine first started coming out, I go, okay, for sure, we'll get, we'll get vaccinated. You know, teachers will get vaccinated pretty soon and then students surely by May. Now it's looking like at least the reports I've seen, you know, the general population is not gonna start getting vaccinated probably till April at the earliest. So it's looking likely like I'm gonna have to cancel that trip. Um, and, and, and just since you brought up Ireland, Mark, let me give a, a plug, just watching the lineup that you've got coming up is just, I mean, spectacular. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to attend the, the session, I forget the name of, name of the book, but the, the, the book on the Mercy Mission to Ireland during the Great Famine. I, I had never known that it was a USS Jamestown 
that was was the ship that did that. I don't know how that escaped my attention before, but uh, two of my great research loves <laughs> are coming together in that text. I'm definitely going to join you for that. Um, what a great line! Of, and 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 thank you. Just looking at those other texts, I'm, I'm just kind of blown away by by the schedule that you've got. Oh, well, thank you very much. Yeah, the gentleman's name is Stephen Puglio, and for those in the, in the audience who have heard him talk, he's, he's, he's worth listening to. So thank you very much for doing this tonight. This has been really interesting, really provocative, and um, a, a, a look on shipwrecks and maroons and Bermuda that I, I, for one, had never thought about. So I really appreciate this. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, stay safe, everyone, and um, uh, we'll we'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.